this way, are we? Put a thumbs up when you want me to start talking right now, it's live. And the participants are coming in. Yeah, I think give them maybe a minute. We've still got a few yeah. lined up, 30 seconds. Great. <clears throat> Welcome back everyone. Pickles seem to look quite fresh. <laughs> Some smiles. So welcoming Ajahn Brahm and um, please do begin whenever you see fit. <laughs> okay, so again, good morning everybody, wherever you are, or good afternoon to myself. And welcome to another day upon, of the Bliss Upon Bliss Upon Bliss retreat. And uh, this morning's talk is just carrying on where you left off about meditation, and how it works and supporting conditions. And one thing which I didn't talk about yesterday, and which is important, was the, the idea of like three stages in every part of your meditation experience. And I always hesitate when I talk about stages, because then people feel that these are things you have to attain and go through. And they forget that sometimes you just bypass stages. You, know, you go on the, the bypass, you don't need to go through them. But nevertheless, these three stages have been helpful to many people. And it's the same experience. If you, you say you get a new job, and when you first go to your, you know, your new place of employment, you, first of all, you've got to find your way around. Find out where your desk or your office or your room is, who is the boss, who is the other people you're working with. So the first stage when you go to a new place or you go to a new home or you go to a retreat center, remember those days, your first day you go into your new room, then the first time is familiarity, first stage. Where, sorry, I've rushed ahead there. It's first stage is recognition. You recognize where you are, where you're supposed to be, what's happening. And once you recognize you know, your, your office, your chair, the people around you, you recognize the people, then you find you get a little bit more relaxed. You feel more safe. But when you go there the first time, you're always more tense. Whenever I go traveling, I'll go to a retreat center or go to a, a, a center or even a hotel. The first night I stay there, I never sleep well, not as well as the second night or the third night. It's just the fact that the first night, you know, your body needs to recognize you know, the new pillow, the new mattress, the new uh, duvet or whatever you have on top of you. And that recognition means that you know where you are, you feel safe, you feel comfortable. And that allows you to go to the next stage, which is called familiarity. And familiarity means you may be the second or third night in the retreat center and you're familiar with your room. It's like it's your own, <coughs> like your own room again, like your own home, like your house. You can recognize the pillow, you recognize the softness of the, the mattress and your way around the room and you feel familiar with it, which allows you to relax a bit more. And then the last stage is like this great sense of ease. You feel safe there because you've been there so many times, you trust the place. And it's only when you're this ease, you can really relax into that situation. So before you get into that situation of relaxing to the max in any stage of meditation, it seems we have to go through these other stages first. First of all, recognition, then familiarity, and then ease. 
And just to give that a practical example, it's like when we are sitting down and I ask you to just scan the body. And first of all, if you haven't done that before, you think, what, what am I supposed to do? What is this scanning of the body? And after a while, you can recognize what it is and how it works. And of course, the next stage is you have familiarity with it. It becomes almost automatic. And the last stage is when you're totally at ease with it. So you can do it and the body just relaxes so deeply and you feel comfortable doing that. Another example, very common, is when you learn how to drive a car. You learn to drive a car first of all. You know, people are just so tight, so scared sometimes that they you know, need another person sitting next to them and just their muscles are tense, their reactions are just not really natural, which means they make a lot of uh, little errors. But once you become, you recognize what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to drive a car, what the rules are, then you soon can relax and become very familiar with it, familiar with the gear stick, familiar with the wheel and the brakes and everything. Until after a while, you get so at ease with driving a car. And I sat next to many people who are driving me here, driving me there, and they can have a talk or they can actually do all sorts of stuff because the driving becomes almost automatic. And this is the same with our meditation. The meditation, all the little stages of meditation or landmarks, as I try to call them, after a while we recognize what they mean, where they are. And we soon become familiar with them, we come at ease with them, so we don't get scared with about them, we don't feel afraid. We feel so safe. So safety isn't something which just comes immediately, automatically. Safety is a sense of recognizing what's going on, becoming familiar with it, and learning to become at ease with it. And all of these stages of the that can apply to so many things, even you know, sometimes. I'm sitting there in my hall in Bodhinyana Monash and a lay person comes out, they want to talk about something with me. And at first you can see they, you know, they're not quite sure how they're supposed to relate to a senior Buddhist monk. You can see them tense, not just in their body, but also in their mind. So they can't really sort of uh, speak honestly and openly. But after a while they recognize me and then it's only old Ajahn Brahm. And then they start to become familiar, you know, say a few jokes and funny stories, which relaxes them even more. And then they can become at ease and then they can ask all these questions about themselves. And they know that whatever they say is going to be respected and treated with, with care. And you know, the best answer I can give will be given. So all those stages of uh, recognition, familiarity and ease also work with this practice of meditation. But the main part of the uh, meditation teachings today is a simile which I've expanded enormously uh, about the path of meditation and, and using a simile which you can you know, even visualize helps you understand what to do and how it works and why it works. And it gives you an enhancement of this process of recognition familiarity and ease. And this is that old story of the thousand petal lotus. And it is a simile which was you know, used a lot in uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, but it's a very valid simile for Theravada Buddhism, in fact, if just for meditation. And I love the simile because uh, the lotus is something which just about everybody has seen. And they know how a lotus opens up and the similar is, similar, simile is very helpful to understanding what you're doing in meditation, how not to meditate, and also just what happens when you do it properly. So the thousand petal lotus simile is, recognizes that a lotus is always closed up at night time. And I remember so many times just looking early in the morning or late at night at lotuses which were closed up and the outermost, I won't even call them petals, the outermost sheath of that lotus is like corrugated. It's not smooth at all. I think that may be to give it some toughness. And it has no fragrance. And it has no 
Well, I'd say no beauty to it. It's not colored like the inner petals of a lotus. And the outermost sheath of that lotus is also quite thick because its whole purpose is to protect the lotus at nighttime. And what happens next is that when the sun comes up in the morning and it starts to shine on that closed lotus, the warmth of the sun and the light of the sun so strike the outermost petal and the, that outermost petal or sheath starts to open up. It opens up slowly, but you know, as long as that sun is shining on it, the warmth and the light will open it up. You can't rush it. It just has to happen according to its natural process. And as it opens up, it allows the warmth and the light of the sun to strike the next layer of petals. You know, the, the real first layer of petals, if you like, and allow them to receive that warmth and light so those layer of petals open up as well. And that allows the next layer of petals to receive the warmth of the light of the sun. And that starts to open up. And so stage by stage, petal by layer, layer of petal by layer of petals, the outside one opens up. So the light of the sun and the warmth of the sun can actually strike the next layer and open that up as well. And that's how the lotus flower opens up layer by layer by layer by layer. And if you've seen those lotuses open up, the deeper you go into that lotus, the more beautiful are the colorings on those petals, and the more fragrant they are, and the more delicate they are. As you go deeper and deeper into that lotus, the petals get more and more uh, refined. And that is similar to this thing we call meditation. As we open our body and mind, we go inside. The deeper we get, the more refined, the more beautiful, the more fragrant, the more delicate are these stages or landmarks, as I was calling them. But also the most important part of this simile is how that lotus is opened up. That lotus is opened up because of the warmth and the light of the sun and your body and mind are opened up because of the warmth of kindness and the light of awareness, mindfulness. It's mindfulness and kindness working together like the light and the warmth from the sun. And I've tried so many other different methods of meditation, trying force, trying determinations, but the kindness and the a mindfulness, what I keep on calling kindfulness, that is the one which I've always found the most effective and the most simple. And I call it simple because it's something which you start at the beginning to open up this rough outermost sheath of your body and mind. And it's what you use in the very, very finer stages from nimittas into jhanas and from jhanas onwards, it's just almost automatic. That's all you need to do. Am I being kind? Am I being aware? And just let those two just dominate what you're doing in meditation. Actually, it's not doing anything. The kindness is what permits things to be. Just like that simile of my father, may the door of my heart be open to you no matter what you do in your life, he told me. And that's what I do when I'm meditating, looking whatever's in front of me right now. Whatever I'm aware of right now, it's important to me. And I care so much about this content of this present moment. I say to it, whatever you are, wherever you're going, the door of my heart's open to you, present moment. Come in. And yesterday I told you when you have negative things in your mind, I too open my, my heart to those. For some reason, they've got to teach me something. And they'll keep coming back again, unless I have the, the little bit of respect to let even unpleasant experiences of life teach me their lesson.
Otherwise, they keep coming back again. So little by little, you realize that the kindfulness is the path, in short. So you start looking at, first of all, in the simile of the thousand petaled lotus, you start looking at this body. You're sitting down, hopefully comfortably, and you see if you can make your body more comfortable just by adjusting the, uh, the positions of your feet or your legs or your butt or your clothes or your position of your hands, uh, just you know, how your head is balanced on top of the neck. You do that with kindness and awareness. And the wonderful thing about the awareness and mindfulness, it always gives you feedback. So if you do decide to move, you can actually feel whether that movement has made it more comfortable or less comfortable. So that way you become very skilled at finding the most comfortable position for your body right now with what you've got with where you are. And that mindfulness and kindness soon gets this body to be so comfortable. You do get the delightful comfortness, delightful relaxation, sorry, which I was been mentioning. And once you have the delightful relaxation experience, and that's almost like a signal to me that this kindfulness has done its job. And the body is very, very relaxed. And the next thing which happens, even if you don't decide to look at pisometers and that sort of stuff, after a little while, your body will disappear as you go inside because the body and its sensations are not doing very much. They're not, dis they're not interfering with you not creating business for you to attend to it disappears and that's you know the simile again which i first learned uh i don't know maybe some of you have been to this place it used to be called Thwassel hall over in northumberland it started off as a, a zen monastery and i went there oh i was still only 73 i think or 72 and just to do a weekend retreat. I was not into Zen meditation, but it was just the only place where there was a retreat where I was um, hanging out at the time. So I took the opportunity to do a retreat and I always had the idea, it's not a bad idea, it doesn't matter who the teacher is or what you're supposed to be doing. No one can actually get inside your head to see what's going on. So they could be teaching one thing, but in my mind, I was actually doing my usual meditation. But anyway, I remember the occasion when I was asked to keep your eyes open when you're meditating and to stare at a whitewashed wall. It was in an old barn in those days. And I was just staring at this wall for maybe half an hour. And I did have the good fortune to have learned how to keep your mind reasonably still. So I wasn't thinking and I wasn't in a moment. And then, of course, what happened was the wall vanished. It just disappeared. It was like a weird experience, like someone had zapped the wall and it wasn't there anymore. And it was such a striking experience for me, totally unexpected. But I wasn't at all scared because I thought this was weird. This is interesting. This is the sort of stuff from which you can get some insights. Not the usual stuff, but strange stuff. And so when I, afterwards, when I reflected, it was a pretty clear experience and pretty obvious explanation. It's just the way your eyes work, why the sense of sight can only notice things which change. What happens is because that wall was white and it wasn't changing, and my focus was on it for long enough, it wasn't going off to thoughts, or to, you know, thinking of old music, which I'd heard earlier on, I was a lay person at the time, because it was just focused on seeing and the sight object wasn't changing, the sight turned off. And it's the simile I use for that these days is that if you don't press a computer button, sometimes the screen turns off. It's almost like a saver for the brain, so it doesn't have to do too much work. And stillness created disappearance and cessation 
of the sense of sight. That's an important thing for me to understand and not be afraid of, because when things disappeared, there was so much more freedom. So that's where I started to learn just how when your body becomes still, comfortable, not demanding your attention because it's really relaxed, then it can disappear very easily. And it doesn't mean you go unconscious because there's so many other things happening inside. So this is how you open up the outermost petal of the lotus, your body. How those five senses are subdued enough, not totally turned off yet, but they're subdued, restrained, so you can see what's going on inside. And of course, inside is your emotional world. This next layer of petals, the mindfulness and the kindness created a stillness so that the body can just almost disappear. And it's also sometimes this other simile which people gave to me, which I thought was very apt. It was like when you go to a place, you park your car, and you maybe go into the, the shopping center or maybe the monastery or the the treat center, wherever you're going. And you make sure when you, you uh, before you lock the car that uh, no valuables are in the car which could be stolen and everything is in its right place. You don't leave stuff in there which you need in the temple or in the shopping center. And then you lock the car and then you can walk away knowing that car is safe. No one's going to take it away. It's going to be there for you when you come back after doing your business. That's the same with your body. It's like locking your car. It's perfectly safe. You've done it many times before and no one's going to take it away. No one's going to harm it. It's in a nice safe car park. And sometimes your meditation uh, chair or meditation cushion is like the car park. It's your little car parking bay. And you put it down there lock it up in the sense of making it nice and comfortable and the body can vanish for a while. So you can do other things. And so then you start to be aware of your emotional world. That's the next layer of petals in the thousand petal lotus. In that emotional world, you'll find, first of all, on the outside, you now we have this, this uh, layer of petals, which I call time. And we're just so obsessed with past and future, what's going to happen, where we've come from, what we're going to do. But after focusing on time with mindfulness and with kindness, you find that time of the past and time of the future tends to get so soft, it soon vanishes completely away. I say to be kind because Often people say that you should let go of the past and the future, but they don't tell you how to do that very much. The one a wonderful trick to lessen the power of the past and to reduce the obsession with the future is to be kind to the past and the future. For example, somebody may have hurt you and may have said the wrong things or cheated you or really given you a hard time. How can you be kind? to that event. You can say, well, I'm not quite sure why they did that. They may have had some reason for it. Use any excuse to forgive them. Maybe they're having a very bad day. Maybe I didn't understand what was going on. Maybe I deserve that. Maybe I'm using up some of the bad karma, which I did to them in an early life. Whatever it does to give kindness to that event, you find it makes it easier to let it go. And you think that if a person treats me like that, how must they treat themselves? It's something which the Dalai Lama once said, if your boss, or I don't know, hopefully never your partner, if they give you a hard time, remember your boss, you only have to be with them so many hours a day, five days a week. But they have to be with themselves 24 hours for seven days a week forever. And how people treat you is often how they treat themselves. So you have this wonderful kindness, compassion for the poor things. It must be really hurting. And when you 
look at life like that, it's so easy to be kind to the past. It's easy to let go. It's easy for it to disappear and you're kind to the future. Well, sometimes I do look at the news sites and people always say the very worst things which can happen in news sites because it makes people actually read those news sites. Most of the terrible things which they say are going to happen, actually most of them never do happen. I'm not just a positive person. Sometimes I'm a realistic person. And sometimes all those terrible things, they don't happen at all. Well, at least they're not as bad as the newspapers would like to think you think uh, they will be. Because the newspapers, they all have to exaggerate a little bit. I'm not talking about fake news. I'm talking about exaggerated news. Because that makes people read those newspapers and get concerned. But for your future, you know, the problems are for your future. They're probably going to be much better than you expect. That's lovely story, Winnie the Pooh, I can't resist this. Winnie the Pooh walking through the forest with little piglet. A big storm happening. And little piglet, being a small fellow, got very, very frightened until he could walk no further. And he squeezed Winnie the Pooh's hand and said, I can't go on. What would happen if a tree fell when we were underneath it? It was a possibility that could happen. And Winnie the Pooh said with great wisdom that what would happen if a tree fell when we weren't underneath it? <laughs> they had this different perception, which was actually far more probable, was enough to take away their fear. And so they didn't think of the future and think what might go wrong. They thought of the future with kindness, what might go right. And that was enough for them to complete their journey. So when we are kind to the future and kind to the past, you'll find that the past and future do disappear. The mindfulness and kindness work to recover into the, the present moment just now. You know, sometimes even the present moment, it's easy to say, but people do need to recognize what the present moment means and to become familiar with it. And then to feel at ease with the present moment. Many people don't feel at ease with it. They think, you know, what am I supposed to do? And where am I supposed to go? Always thinking of the future or dragging the past. The last time I was in the present moment, it didn't work. All those past and future memories, it's not really the present moment. The present moment, you're right here. Whatever you experience is the most important thing in the whole world. And you're kind to it. Mindfulness and kindness again. And after a while, just you get used to the present moment. And that's, by that time, it's a, quite a fragrant set of petals which you've opened up. And the petals of time, you are now in the present moment, they start to open up because the next problem is the thinking. Always trying to give comments about what you're experiencing, trying to take notes, trying to judge things, you know that uh, because of my science background, there was a great scientist called Lord Kelvin, who was the founder of the Royal Society in London, and still going hundreds of years since. And he made this wonderful quote at the time when we started the um, Industrial Revolution. And he said, if you want to control nature, if you want to control nature, you have to learn how to measure her accurately first. He made the wonderful connection between control and measurement. And once when somebody asked me that question, I still don't know why they asked me that question, but I'm very grateful to them because you turned it the other way around. If you don't measure things, you can't control them. You don't measure your meditation and take notes. You don't sort of think, you know, is this a good meditation or a bad meditation? What's going on? If you try to leave taking notes for the time being, you can't control anything. And not controlling, another way of saying you're letting go, or you're just letting it be. You're just letting it evolve by itself. 
instead of making it happen. And after a while, you find so many things in your life when you just let them be, you relax and the world goes a lot better instead of always trying to control everything. Obviously, that's a generalization and so many exceptions to that. But in meditation, it works so well. But when you get into the present moment, please don't try and think about it and control it and think what you're going to do next. Just leave it alone. And if you leave the present moment alone, you get so close into the present moment, you can't think. And that layer of petals called no thinking, concept, control, trying to take notes, thinking that just by thoughts you could own things, that just opens up and disappears. You get this silent present moment awareness. And even silence, silence and present moment awareness are actually very common in your daily life, only that you don't notice them. Anything which is not silent, which is uh, frightening or demanding of your attention, that is like the bad news in the, the newspaper articles. But of course, that stands out. It's one of the reasons why they do exaggerate the dangers in order to make you pay attention. But real life, the silence and the present moment is more common than you imagine. And after a while, once you recognize it, what we're talking about, once you recognize the present moment, you recognize the silence, you find you're not afraid of it anymore. You become familiar and you're at ease with it, which allows silence to happen much more often. And the old story which I say is from the Taoist tradition. Now, Su was walking with one of his disciples and they had a rule in their monastery not to talk on the walk with the master. When they came to this ridge of the mountains at sunset, it was a beautiful sunset. And the new student on the walk with the master said, wow, what a beautiful sunset. He'd broken the rule, he'd spoken. And Lao Tzu, the great Taoist master, turned around, went back to the temple. And once he got back, he told everyone else that that young man was never allowed to go on a walk with him ever again, because he broke the rule. That was just a bit harsh a punishment. So when people said, why? And what's wrong with saying what a beautiful sunset? And that is when Lao Tzu replied. When my disciple, that young man said, what a beautiful sunset. He wasn't watching the sunset anymore. He was only watching the words. When I first read that, he got it straight away. And I thought it was a beautiful expression and description of the difference between observing something in silence and observing your thoughts about it. And so many people in our modern world are just observe and no thoughts. They don't know the real thing. So after a while, we, we develop our silent awareness. And if ever, if ever you have to do any studies, it's so important to learn how to be silent when you're listening to the lecturer or the teacher or you're reading a book or even seeing a video. Try to be silent. You find you will take in so much more. And to amplify that, I do remember when I was a young man going to concerts. I even went to classical music concerts. And classical music I really enjoyed. I didn't quite know why until later on when I became a good meditator that when you were listening to a concert, classical music, you had to be quiet inside your head. You couldn't think, you couldn't make a comment because the flow of the music would be interrupted and you would not enjoy it anymore. So I realized afterwards I had learned a lot of silence just by listening to beautiful music. These days, you don't listen to beautiful music. Sometimes you just listen to the sound of the wind in the trees. Because I live in a forest. And you just listen to that. So you don't try and judge it or capture it or photograph it or record it. You just let it be. 
in silent present moment awareness and the sounds of nature are great because you can't predict what what leaf is going to rustle next or what sound of the rain is going to do next you know the future of those nature sounds are just totally uncertain so you can't go to the future and those sounds are already gone by the time they're happening so you can't really linger in the past so there's so much present moment awareness and silence when you're out in nature, which is one of the reasons why that during a retreat like this, if you feel a bit tight inside or you feel a bit dull, it's all possible to sit in front of a window, open a window and just look at if you have any trees in the garden or if you have any, any uh, wind or you've got some, a, a scene of like a, a, a meadow or something, just sit there and watch it in silence, in a moment. And because you know, we have Jhana Grove in the middle of a forest, this is our retreat center in Perth. So often when people's meditation is not going that well, I send them out, go and just sit on a chair there and just watch the trees grow. That's my little sort of trick question. Just watch the trees grow, which means that you do nothing. Just watch. Be aware and be kind. And some people have the most wonderful experiences doing that because they notice the silence in the mind and they're in the moment. So that becomes a very beautiful layer of petals inside of you. You just opened up to that. Those outer petals of thinking, those outer petals of time, those outer petals of body have disappeared. They've opened up and you're inside of them. And then once you get to silence, as I mentioned yesterday, so often as you go into silence, that opens up and you can feel your breath. Because the only thing left moving. This happens naturally to me. So you can feel your breath. By that stage, you still have your silence, you still have your present moment. You can feel the breath just happening right now. And your mindfulness has improved. So you see the breath and it becomes, as I said, delightful. So you see the breath and the full breath, and then the delightful breaths. By the time you get to the delightful breaths, like I was saying yesterday, um, in my evening or afternoon session on those uh, stages of Anapanasati, it becomes gorgeous, pet, gorgeous layers of the of your lotus, gorgeous layers of petals inside of you. It's so beautiful, so fragrant, and so delicate. Because of that, you're opening up your lotus, and this metaphor of the lotus means you cannot try and get, uh, get on to the next stage. You've got to stay where you are. Enjoy. Enjoy the beauty of a delightful breath. And just after a while, it will just open up. The beauty will get stronger. Breath will disappear and you see these beautiful lights. So once you get a limit what do you do next? Just be kind, be, be aware, just see what happens. And even if they're moving around, let them move around. Don't try and stop them. If they move around, let your mindfulness go with them. That's that metaphor which I use whenever I used to go traveling in an aircraft, and I told people I don't go anywhere. So the aircraft does the moving, I just do the sitting. And you know, when I arrive, I'm still here. And this is one of the reasons why that even what you do in meditation can translate you know, into your daily life. You don't think, how long is it till I get there? Where have I come from? You're always in this moment. Enjoying the, the restfulness of a nice, comfortable chair in an aircraft, if you've got one. So that way we learn how to be in this moment, just enjoying and enjoying the delightful breath when we get to this stage. And that, where, where do we go next? We go into the limiters, they just happen. And you don't need to be afraid of them or no need to want them. They just occur by themselves. And I have to say this, that Many people experience limiters, but as soon as they get the limiters, they start to, you know, just to forget how meditation works and go, yay, woo, I've got a limiter. What type of limiter is it? Let's take this into a deeper meditation. 
Please know that are just natural, just like present moment awareness and silence and watching the breath. They're just part of what's happening. So keep the silence. Shh. Be still. And little by little, those nimitas will relax. At first, those nimitas, you've got to recognize what they are. That's why I get so many questions. Was this a nimitta? Was this not a nimitta? What type of nimitta was it? After a while, you don't really need to ask any teacher. You just gather information yourself. Remember to just be aware and be kind. Don't try and control or own. And after a while, those nimitas, they settle down just by mindfulness and kindness. Just like those of you who have a child and the child is very sort of excited and then it's time for them to go to bed, you sit next to them and you don't just grab them by the throat and say, go to sleep or I'll kill you. That's not gonna settle the, the kid down. You just speak very slowly and very kindly. Maybe stroke their hair there. It's okay, mummy and daddy are here. You're safe, you've got a big day tomorrow. Just shh, go to sleep. That's how you treat nimitus. Sometimes nimitus might be like kids jumping up and down on the bed. But you just are kind to them. Yeah, it's okay, shh, relax. Until so those nimitus, you recognize them, you're familiar with them, you're at ease with them, and they become at ease with you. They settle down. Because you're not wasting any energy at all, they get really bright. Now you're really opening up deep layers of your lotus. And soon those limiters, beautiful, incredibly beautiful limiters, they open up. Just like the petals of the lotus open up. And what have you been doing? Just mindfulness and kindness. And they open up and inside of them you see these incredible jhanas. Breath has disappeared. That was many petals back. The nimitas, the lights have disappeared. That was also the last petal. It's beautiful bliss. Very refined states, these jhanas, which you know, they do just sometimes. When, when you're actually inside, you're not shocked at all, but after, wow, what the heck was that? But these are the deep meditations, and they happen. You're just opening up the lotus. And as you open the lotus further, Second jhana, this is inside the first, the third is inside the second. All these ones, and one inside the other. Until you go into the what's called the immaterial. Now I'm saying this because I may be way ahead of many of you. But I think many of you know me and trust me. So as you go deeper and deeper, all these layers, they open up until those last immaterial layers in the four arupa states, they are so refined. It's almost like transparent. As they open up, the last one opens up and you get to the, the heart in the lotus, the center of it. And which is very easy for people to say, there's nothing, empty, nothing left, totally gone. However, you know, people argue about that and they haven't even got into a first journey yet. But nevertheless, that's what happens. That's how you can experience this for yourself. The thousand petal lotus simile helps because it shows you all these things are just stages, just landmarks as you go deeper and deeper into stillness and into bliss. And these incredibly blissful states. I have to be careful when I say they're incredibly blissful because that automatically just generates some desire in you. And it's okay to have that desire, as long as you know that in order to fulfill that desire, just wanting and will and control just doesn't work. And instead, we follow the path of kindness and awareness, the kindfulness path, which has nothing to do with what you normally think as effort. Once you practice it, you realize it's a very refined type of effort. The effort to stop interfering and just look upon what's happening. This gorgeous, the door of my heart's open to you, no matter what you are, no matter what happens. And 
I am aware. And that's all. Such a simple way of meditating. But unfortunately, people like complicated stuff. And sometimes the more complicated you make it, the more people say, oh, yeah, now I understand. But you don't. Keep it simple. Be aware and be kind and open up your notice. So there we go. That went very quick. It's a 45 minutes now since I started. And I was asked today to keep the talk to 45 minutes and now to have a five minute break. Five minutes, is that the time? Yeah, five minutes. And then to have a 40 minute guided meditation at the end. So that's what I was asked and I'm very happy to oblige. So now is the time for a five minute break. So off you go to the toilet or get some water or whatever you need to do. And at five more minutes time, we'll start the guided meditation, but this time for 40 minutes. Okie dokie. And for those of you who just stay, I'm just chit chat, it's not really important. But it reminded me that when and I was asked to make this a 45 minute talk instead of the usual hour, it reminded me that, that once when I went to Sri Lanka and the disciples over there introduced me to the, the president of the time, Rajapaksa, he was a the president then, and Rajapaksa was so impressed, he said, I want you to give a talk at this big convention center, the uh, BMICH, on live TV. And so his live TV talk, and uh, for that talk, they, they said, the producers said, look, Ajahn Brahm, we respect Buddhist monks, but it has to be exactly one hour. And if it's 55 minutes and you don't know what to say, just make something up because this is TV. We don't know what to do if it's too short. And if it's too long, we're going to cut you off. After one hour, that's it. You may be in the middle of a sentence. We've got to cut you off to go to the next program. So that was a really nice test. When you're giving a talk, when you have to do it just for one hour, almost to no, 10 seconds either way. And I, this was the subject of the talk I gave there, the Thousand Petal Lotus. And when you make that resolution, it's just going to be for one hour, or in this time for 45 minutes. It's amazing just how the mind cooperates. And that talk it did finish just maybe two seconds before the one hour was was up. And it, and it didn't seem like it was planned to be an hour, it just went quite naturally. The mind is an amazing thing when you trust it. You don't force it. You don't have fear and worry. So anyway, that was just a little anecdote from my past. Okay, okay, I'm gonna shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> for three minutes. <laughs>
Okay. Is now a good time or should we wait for another minute? Okay, good time now. Very good everybody. So now we're going to do a 40 minute guided meditation. But in those guided meditations of 40 minutes, I'm not going to keep talking every minute of those 40 minutes. We're going to get you going, guide you at the beginning, and then let you go. In other words, so once you fight, feel some peace and some um, increase of mindfulness, then all those instructions which I've given so far for many of you, then they will find they will take over for you. It's almost as if that you've given the instructions and they're remembered by the mind, not the brain. And those instructions will begin to work and see where they lead you to. So anyway, so now we can start the meditation. So please close your eyes. With those eyes closed, you can feel the body with much greater sensitivity. And as the retreat progresses, the mindfulness increases naturally. The tiredness gets less. And you can feel the body with much more clarity. And as you're feeling the body, first of all, generally feeling it, you're aware of it. Now, please remember the kindness. Because I've been sitting down a long time, my bottom is aching. So I'm going to adjust my position on my chair. And then that's a rough adjustment of the body. And now I go to much more refinement, part of the body, one after the other. Starting with my feet. I like to, my chair is about the right height. If the chair is too low, then put a cushion under your butt. Chair is too high, put a cushion under your feet. In other words, do whatever is needed to make sure that your legs are comfortable. Or you can move your feet further away from your body to get them comfortable. And those movements which I've just made myself, I'm mindful as I'm doing them and afterwards. I find out that there is a difference. I'm now more comfortable. That's the whole purpose of the kindfulness. To make it so your body is at ease. I've been doing this a long time now, so I've gone past the stage of recognizing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm familiar with my body and I'm at ease with it. I know how it works. And how to get it in a nice position. Not always the same position but one which is comfortable right now, right here. And the comfort of my body right in front of me is the most important thing in the world to me right now. And I'm kind to it. So once my feet are comfortable, I move up my legs. See my whole legs, left leg and right leg. And I do treat them as independent beings, asking them, like I would ask a good friend, are you comfortable right now? Is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable? That's what I say to my legs. And even simple things, like my left leg below the knee, knee needs a scratch. So I'm just gonna give it a quick scratch. what happens with my body, like most people, if you just attend to them, are kind to them, give them something, give them your attention, then they, so as if they say, thank you, 
they relax a bit more. So my awareness is just on my two legs right now. Nothing else in the whole world, just my two legs, caring for them. I can feel some tense muscles. I'm getting my left leg under my thigh, and the underneath part, close to the knee. I don't know why, but then I'm just aware of it, wishing it well, relaxing it. You can feel the sensation there. And the kindness eases it off. Oh, it's great, it's gone now. Please experiment with that on your body. Any tightness and tension, please notice it. Don't think it's insignificant to the meditation path. Notice it and go into it. Be kind to it. You find after a while you can relax parts of your body which other people think is impossible to relax. You can do it. And that gives you a wonderful ability not just in meditation, but in life, to be able to just have good health, not tighten up and tense up. Oh, my left leg feels great. Same as my right. So I can leave them alone now. Go to my butt. Oh, my poor bottom, sitting down for so long. That's one of the problems of being a monk, always sitting down. But I know my bottom very well. I know its sensations. My top part of my body is well balanced enough. So I cannot really leave those sensations in my bottom any further except just to be kind to them and wish them well. Then go up to my waist. And up to my whole back. People have a lot of trouble with their backs, cause them so much pain. And a lot of the time it's because their awareness of their back was not there when they entered it. So I look at my back and it, it wants a stretch. I give it a stretch. And that's like free happiness. When you stretch, you feel this beautiful sense of, it was endomorphins going into to your bloodstream. And then I let go, let the body just, the back especially, just relax to the max. I go to my uh, shoulders now. And if you had your eyes open, you'd see me just rolling them around, just moving them left to right to exercise them, to loosen them, to make sure that they too are comfortable. It's not just comfort of the body, which I am practicing. It's also kindfulness. So I build up the kindfulness by practicing it on my body. So when I go inside, the kindfulness is already pretty strong. And it's not so distracted. And my body is important lasted almost 70 years now. It's got quite a few more years to go, so I've been to look after it. That's what I'm doing right now. And once the shoulders are at ease, I go down my arms. And asking my arms, arms, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you to make your, you more comfortable? Just like the anger eating monster simile, even thoughts of kindness make the monster grow an inch smaller and less of a problem. The thoughts of kindness to my arms make them relax more. And then at the end of my arms, I have my wrists and hands. And I ask them, are you comfortable? Are you really comfortable? Because I care. I want you to be at peace.
And then my hands start to relax. I just enjoy the attention. I'm thankful. I'm giving it kindness and mindfulness. And I can notice the feeling in my hands is far more at ease than it was a few seconds ago. Can you notice that with your hands? They are getting more relaxed, more comfortable. You go back up to your shoulders and your neck. Always make sure my neck is comfortable because otherwise you can get headaches, you can get really aches and pains in your neck. I just move my head around until I can feel the optimum position of my head on top of my neck. And then I go to the front of my face. The muscles on my forehead, around my eyes, and my nose, my mouth. You can feel them. How do you feel, face? What can I do to make you more comfortable? And we asked that question for so many years. I know, I've learned from the feedback given by mindfulness, how to be kind, how to relax the muscles around my eyes, around my mouth, around my forehead, and I can feel them relaxing now. The mindfulness shows you what happens when you relax and how wonderful it is to have a peaceful, relaxed body. And then I'm aware of my whole body, from the top of the head to the feet, to the tips of the fingers, relaxed to the max. And if there's a bit you missed out, which is causing you some sort of tightness. Just focus in there and give it kindness. Don't try and cure it, care for it. Look upon it like the monster in the Empress Palace. Welcome. You find that welcoming attitude, the kindness attitude, takes away the overreaction of the body which creates most of the pain. Caring for your body, all parts of it. You're aware to know where you have to look. You get the results. The results show you when you're kind to your body, you're aware of it. It relaxes so well. You have insight, understanding what happens, the result. Mindfulness and kindness on your own body. As I've been repeating all these times, I, I don't stop being aware of my body until I have this beautiful delight. The joy of a relaxed body encourages me, shows even at this preliminary stage of opening up your lotus. It's a delightful process. It's not one of endurance, but one of bliss upon bliss upon bliss. Quite naturally, after a while you just go inside. Your emotional world, your mind, that becomes very prominent once the body is looked after. It's like the lotus sheath, the outermost sheath of your body opens up so you can go inside, see your mind. And first of all, 
it's just natural. You see the part of the mind which deals with time. Each one of us has a history. And we project that history onto the future. There are so many memories, so many worries about the future. If you like, you can practice this little visualization. Imagine you've been to the shopping center and you're carrying these two really heavy bags, one in your left hand or one in the right hand. You don't know how long you've been carrying them, but already your arms ache and your shoulders hurt. I'm sure you've all experienced that before, or something similar. And you look down upon the bag in your left hand, and you see that, just like most shopping bags, they have the name of the store written on the outside. This is not an ordinary store because the words on the, or the letters on the outside of that bag are the four letters P A S T. I shall pass. And inside that bag, you have so many memories good memories, bad memories, and some are so in the bottom of their bag, you know, they're almost like subconscious. They're there and they're very heavy. You can't really fully see them because all the other memories on top of them. All those memories there, both good and bad, and they're so heavy to carry around for such a long time, like the real memories. They make your, your brain tired. And it makes your heart weak. And then you imagine the bag in your right hand. And that has the letters F-U-T-U-R-E on the outside. That's your future. Inside that bag are all your fears, your anxieties, and your hopes and dreams as well. Everything to do with the future is crammed into that really heavy bag called the future. And you've been carrying that for too long as well. That's why you your brain is tired and your heart is tired too. It has no joy, no lightness. So you feel those heavy bags. You can't throw them away because your responsibilities are in there. Well, you can do that. You imagine yourself leaning to the left. That allows you to lower the bag in your left hand representing your past, allows you to lower it to the floor, this imaginary exercise. When it meets the ground, the weight, the burden vanishes. And that allows you to move your hand away from the handle of the bag and move your left hand up, straighten your back, so your left arm and hand is, is hanging loosely by your side, relaxed, recovering. Even your shoulders, the tightness, the tension starts to be released. You put the bag of your past down on the floor. Now you have the bag in your right hand, representing your future fears, anxieties, worries, as well as plans and dreams. Now you lean to the right and you lower that back to the floor, slowly. When it meets the floor, all the weight, the heaviness goes. And then that allows you to move your hand away, your right hand. Move it up to your right side. So your right shoulder, arm and hand can also have some time to rest and recover. And then you look down. On your left is the bag representing your past. On the right is the bag representing your future. And you, 
and standing in this wonderful place of rest in the center called the present moment. You know you don't need to worry about those two bags. No one will take them away. You just put them down for a while to rest. That's all. They're safe. Enjoy the time of rest. Of not having to carry the past. Or worry about the future. You're in this moment. And be kind enough to yourself and aware enough of what it's like to be in the present to give yourself this opportunity. You deserve to have these moments of freedom. Just being here in this present moment right now. You've opened up another layer of petals and come into the present moment just now. Try not to pick up any of those items from the past or the future. Leave them where they belong, in the bag. This is your free time. And you need this. You deserve it. You need to increase the muscles of your arms and your shoulders and your heart and your brain by relaxing. As you're staying in this present moment, as you're recognizing what it means, as you become familiar with it, with ease with it, and you don't need to protect it anymore, and it stays. You can relax in here. Then you may notice these thoughts, these ideas, the inner speech. Silence is not strong yet. But also remember that there are things like spaces between words. So listen to my speech now and when one word has ended. What's it like before the next word begins? This is so you can recognize what silence means. The space between your thoughts. Awareness. Kindfulness. With no name. No inner conversation. You are listening to life instead of talking back at life. It takes a while to get recognition and familiarity and ease with silence. Once you notice it and that easy enough, so delightful. Be kind to silence. Silence will smile back at you. A beautiful layer of petals right inside the present moment. I don't know when it happens for you, but already in my silence, the breath is manifesting. I feel it. 
If it's not the right time, I go back to the silence. All the words I'm saying are almost automatic. It's like I'm not really saying them. I'm silent. The mouse is doing the talking. I'm doing the listening. I can feel the breathing. I'm a, a watcher of the breath. It's like it's my friend. I don't own it, tell it what to do. I don't tell it off. It's like oh, I hold its hand. It's a metaphor. I hold the hand of my breath. We walk together for a while. Totally at ease in each other's company. Just experiencing the breath. Silently in the moment. The longer I notice it, the easier it is to notice. Relax, sorry, recognize, be familiar, and be at ease. If the breath wants to disappear and go back to the present moment, fine. You're not controlling this path, you're being kind to it. It's all you ever do. Aware and kind. That's all the sun does. Gives light and warmth. Things grow by themselves. And presses back. I'm in the present moment, silent. Nothing much I can do, except be kind and aware. So, I don't really have much choice. I'm going to be quiet now. See how deep into your lotus you can be.
Oh, you feel you down. Very close to the end of this meditation period. Those of you who want to continue on on this meditation, please feel free to do so. I shall be able to start coming out from my meditation experience, my peaceful mind, come out to feel my body, I don't move yet, I feel my legs and my butt, my back, my shoulders, arms, hands, Head. So relaxed. And slowly I open my eyes. And with the eyes open, I move my hands and my body again. the end of this meditation today.
Ooh. Okay. So I look forward to seeing you again later on in another two hours time. Till 